So thank you all for being here. My name is Max Page. I'm the president of the Massachusetts Teachers Association. And as many of you know, we represent about 115,000 um, educators across the state in virtually every city and town and also on the 29 public college and university campuses. And we're really thrilled to be here today to talk about our goals and our priorities for the next legislative session under a new governor. Um, and I guess the, where I want to start with, and I've uh, people in who work with me a lot know that I have planned on doing this for the next six months, which is celebrate the passage of question one on November 8th. And I want to note that there are t-shirts over there. Please walk out with them. They're heirlooms. They will sell for a lot on eBay someday. Um, but really, this was an incredible historic victory and a big thank you to our legislators as well. This legislature, or two legislatures, voted four times to put this to the people, to give the people the chance to vote on taxing multimillionaires in order to fund permanently, um, through our Constitution, our public schools and colleges and universities and roads, bridges and transportation. This is something a lot of us have been working on for decades, to make a more fair tax system, and it's incredible that we did it. So I'm really pleased about that, and it sets us up. It sets the, sets the table for some incredible opportunities in this coming legislative session. The only thing I want to say uh, before quickly saying hello to and welcome to some of our legislators here is that the only mistake we can make will be thinking too small and having too cramped a vision. One of the great goals of when passing fair share was making a more ta fair tax system. It was generating $2 billion a year for public schools and colleges and transportation. But underneath all of that, was allowing us to get out of a kind of austerity mindset and actually say, you know what? We can actually have what we need for everyone in the Commonwealth. And it only poses the question, what's next? So I really want to encourage all of us, legislators, members of the, of the community, to think big as we go into this new legislative session in the coming years. Um, let me um, quickly recognize we have a number of legislators here. Senator Pat Jalen, uh, Rep. I Erica Eiderhoven, Rep. Ken Gordon is here as well. Thank you. Uh, Rep. Mike Connolly is still here. I know he has to head out, but thank you for being here. Rep. Joan Machino, see over here. Rep. Sally Kearns. Uh, Rep. Elect James Arena DeRosa. And Rep. Jim Hawkins. Thank you all for being here today. It's great. And I also just want to note that you'll be hearing from some uh, activist leaders and of our locals in the MTA. Um, as well as there are other local leaders who are here. And I did a quick calculation, rather, Molly Labonte from our office did a quick calculation, thank you, Molly, that the, the, the local leaders from the MTA who are here represent about 15,000 MTA members, educators across the K-12 and higher ed sector, and that they serve 150,000 students. So just, a few, just having five or 10 or 15 of these, these leaders here covers a large number of our members and also our students. It's really great um, for them all to be here. So thank you. All right, let me turn it now to Betsy Praval, an educator from Cambridge and the head of our government relations committee that established this legislative agenda. Thank you, Max. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so the MTA, we are committed to improving working and living conditions of our active and retired members, uh, creating outstanding public schools and colleges for all students, and helping the residents of our Commonwealth lead lives of dignity and justice. Calvin. <laughs> <laughs> the historic victory on question one, the Fair Share Amendment, is one way we achieved uh, these goals, um, but Legislation passed on Beacon Hill is another. MTA's legislative agenda focuses on crucial efforts to be sure that public education, pre-K through higher education, receives a fair share of the fair share. Today we present our clear, powerful, and focused agenda that was developed through an intensive member-driven process. Educators from across the Commonwealth submitted their ideas and provided their input through hearings to ensure that our agenda reflects the hopes and aspirations of our entire membership. As my dedicated colleagues uh, will go into further detail about, the MTA legislative agenda covers five important categories. Reinvest in public higher education, 
reinvest in public pre-K through 12 education, ending the high stakes testing regime, securing the right to strike for public employees, and ensuring a secure and dignified retirement. It is time to be bold. The time to wait is over. It is time now to pass legislation that will finally produce the schools that we all deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Before I turn to our, we have four colleagues here who are gonna talk about K-12 investments. I, I wanna just mention that last week, many of you were here, on December 1st, we had an event for kick off the Higher Ed for All campaign where we laid out our agendas for public higher education. You can see the, the first board on the left there, and there's a flyer out here, lays out those four agenda items, debt-free public higher education, student support so students can succeed, fair wages and benefits, especially for our exploited adjunct faculty and staff, and also green buildings um, on our, all our college and state university and UMass campus system. So that we can, we'll be sharing out with the legislature the, the full recording of that event. That last week it was very exciting, but I'm gonna skip right on to um, number two, which is also investing in our pre-K-12 schools. So let me first introduce Tracy Little Sasanecki, the president of the Springfield Education Association. And then she'll in introduce her two colleagues who came with us. We have a flow. You have a flow. Good. All three of you come up here then. <laughs> Paige Everson and Heather Gertrude. Come on up. So we were rehearsing this on the way in the car, so we have a flow here. So Heather's going to go first. Good thing we can reach up here, right? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I would just like to take this opportunity to thank everybody for giving me a platform to share the love I have for the work I do. Uh, my name is Heather Gershman. I'm a school adjustment counselor at Mary Lynch Elementary School, serving grades pre-K to five in Springfield, Massachusetts. Go Lions! <laughs> so, sometimes what goes through many of our heads is, what exactly do school counselors do, right? Um, in mine, just like many of my colleagues, our responses are, what don't we do, okay? Um, so as we can pull back the layers of the multidimensional role of a school counselor, um, the foundational structure that is embedded in our vision, our performance, and our mindset is building relationships with our students, our staff, our families, and our community resources. Our role is a vital component to the safety and the security and well-being of our students as they enter our building each day. As school counselors, we lead trainings and professional development for our teachers and staff to help them understand the meaning and purpose of creating a social and emotional supportive learning environment for our kiddos. We dedicate our time to working with our students on buying into their education and having them understand that effort is everything. We help them develop the skill set of being proud of who they are and what they can and have accomplished, taking accountability, reflect versus react, and working through difficulty opposed to working around it. As our focus is putting students first, we must also honor the work counselors do with bridging the gap with all that are invested in our, in our children. Our roles exude a level of comfort, trust, and safety that our families value, appreciate, and see firsthand. They feel supported, heard, and understood when they see our faces and hear our voices. I just wanna thank you for giving me the opportunity to provide insight on the benefiting factors of school counselors. Thank you very much. My name is Paige Emerson, and for the past eight years, I have been a school adjustment counselor in the Springfield Public Schools at Brightwood Elementary. I service students between the ages of pre-K to five, and I have a ratio of one counselor to 479 students. And I think that that story is fairly common if you were to speak to a school counselor in your area. So our job right now is to speak with you about how we believe that we need to work toward reaching the ASCA ratio of one to 250 students. 
I think that all educators in Massachusetts, we're very used to being on top. If we see anything regarding uh, where in the 50 states where we lie. When you look at this graph that I have up here, you're gonna see that we fall somewhere in the middle. Our ratios don't exist. If you look at New England, out of the six states, we're one of two that do not mandate school counseling. We have the opportunity to change that. The funding that could be provided would allow us to work toward leading the charge and having access be equal for all students in Massachusetts. We know that in the states that do require the mandate, state and local funding helps ensure that that happens. Our hope is that you will be able to make that change with us and help us to provide the, the services that are so desperately needed following COVID, the, the traumas that took place, day-to-day -day issues that we really are the, the guiding force for those families, students, teachers. We, we like to say we bridge the gap, that we're a continuous space that they see throughout their entire time enrolled in our buildings. So thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak as we're, though we are maybe one or two in per building, but uh, we want to strengthen that voice. Thank you. So good afternoon. I've been a professional school counselor in Springfield Public Schools for over 28 years. This past year, I became the president of our local union in Springfield. And as a counselor, I'll just share like a brief story and some of the things that my colleagues and I talk about on a regular basis. I, being a counselor in an elementary school, one of 462, I was then a single counselor in a middle school, one of 300, where I also served as a guidance counselor, which happened to do with scheduling and making sure kids were you know, registered for a summer school. So basically, when there's only one of us, then someone else is missing out. And many times when we look back at our students who fall off the track, we have many of our students who are suffering from mental health issues. I particularly have a few kids that I can put in my head that would spend all day in my office. And then I say to myself, if I had someone else, that other person could be looking after another student. And many times our students find themselves in mental health facilities. Many times our students find themselves in the criminal justice system. And many times I have a colleague now that last year in elementary lost five students. So the money that is for a fair share would definitely increase the counseling ratio, which is desperately so needed, so that our kids and our families can have people that they can depend on. Many of us, we were talking about this in the car, we see our kiddos from K through five. So we're building relationships. And I see kids today that remember me from elementary school, although I don't remember their names, <laughs> except for the ones that always stayed in my office. Um, but we see those kids and we've built those connections with our families. And so this money would help us divvy out the work and get those kids that may not have been seen because we were taking up time doing other duties. I won't even mention those, but just not being available for all of our students. So thank you. Thank you all for making the trip out east to make that important point. You know, I think those numbers are incredible. I think, Paige, what you said was absolutely right. We want to be number one. We think of ourselves as number one. And yet, how is it that in terms of school counseling, we are somewhere middling? That's not right. And we can afford that now. And I should say, I think probably maybe was, was said already how important it is to recognize that the legislature did an incredible act. And we were in collaboration with it by passing the Student Opportunity Act. That was signed into law in November of 2019. Remember what happened three months later. So the need for school counseling is so much greater since the pandemic. So the Student Opportunity Act was done without, obviously, without knowing that we were about to hit this terrible, terrible and traumatic mm -hmm. pandemic. So the need is greater than ever before. I want to have one more person come up here to talk about another aspect of why we need to have further investments in um, pre-K-12 schools. That's Saul Ramos from Worcester. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Max said, my name is Sal Ramos, and I have been an education support professional 
and ESP in the Worcester Public Schools for the past 24 years. I am also the first Vice President of the Educational Association of Worcester. I'm here to speak about the importance of the MTA ESP Bill of Rights and the urgency for our ESP to be paid a living wage. As my friend Carol Strickland once said, education is the most important profession in the world because without it, there would be no other professions. And the ESP are the pillars of that foundation of what we do. No words could be truer. Especially, ESP play critically important roles in our public schools, providing individual and small group instruction to students with disabilities, assisting in early education classes, supporting English learners, driving buses, preparing meals, keeping schools clean, and perform performing myriad administrative and education support functions, all while meeting the needs of the whole student. We are educators and should be treated and respected as such. We are the first and last educators our students see every single day. Without us, our schools would not be able to function. As a paraeducator and brailleist who works one-on-one -on -one with visually impaired students, my primary goal is, is the success of my students and to help them become as independent as possible. But quite often, I find myself spreading myself throughout the classroom and the school to work also with students who have behavior or learning disabilities. And I also constantly serve as an interpreter or a translator for students who are English language learners. Luckily, I speak Spanish and I'm able to offer these services or even find myself using different resources to translate for languages I do not speak, such as Portuguese and even Vietnamese. There is not an a teacher sh shortage. There is actually an educator shortage. And we continue to lose expertise and many educators that do e so many things every single day for our students. Sorry, I lost my place. Uh, the ESP Bill of Rights highlights what ESP need to be completely successful in our professions. They are, but not limited to, affordable health insurance, health and safety, paid medical and family leave, job security, recognition as educators, affordable education to strengthen careers, and a living wage. Year after year, we have been denied the opportunity to say that one job is enough. It is shameful that the majority of ESPs have to work second and third jobs to be able to make ends meet. Some qualify for government assistance, others are one paycheck away from becoming homeless. And I know this because it happened to me about 10 years ago. While working full time for the Worcester Public Schools, I lost my second and third job and could not make ends meet. So for a period of about three months, I was homeless. I packed all my belongings and put them in a storage and slept in my car, sometimes at family or friends' houses, and showered at the local gym. Yet, I was at work every single day because I know the importance, how important and essential our work is. As Max uh, mentioned earlier, the historic passing of the Fair Share Amendment, it can make better working conditions and a living wage possible. A living wage not just for our pre-K through 12 ESP, but also for our classified staff in our community colleges, state universities, and the UMass system. As an educator of 24 years in the Worcester Public Schools and being on the top step, I used to be ashamed to say what I, what I take home, but I no longer am because I know the shame it is not mine. It is those who make the decisions of how much I get paid. I take home, thank you. I take home after taxes, after health insurance, after everything else that is taken out, $847 every two weeks. So imagine with prices going up of apartments, of housing, of cost of living, how much we have to struggle. And that's myself being someone who is single, someone who does not have children. I can only imagine others who have other responsibilities such as children or other um, members of the family that they have to care for. I implore each and every one of you to read and support our ESP Bill of Rights and push for a living wage for our ESP. We are the most hardworking, dedicated, passionate, and caring educators in our educational family. We should be treated with, with professionalism, 
valued as the essential educators we are, and above all, be respected, because you cannot spell respect without ESP. Thank you. <laughs>
understand why there maybe was, um, not maybe misthinking, but that why they were went for that answer, readjust my curriculum and have that data be about the student. The MCAS, the data comes back when they're in the sixth grade. That data has never been relevant or meaningful. We have never been able to use that data that is about accountability to get a new science program or a science lab. Instead, we've lost our librarian. We've lost our after school program. We've lost a wonderful, wonderful music band program at the elementary level because we are constantly trying to catch up to the winners so that we won't be the losers. I had the opportunity to go to the hearing uh, at the Board of Education and we were told that we need to raise the scores, right? Because there's a direct correlation between the score and the amount of money that somebody makes. So it's a good thing, right? If that were the case, the best test takers in the education profession. We are not the ones making the most money. It's a fallacy. I looked before coming here today. Phillips Academy, regarded as the number one private high school in the country. $65,000 a year. Milton Academy, $64,000 a year. BC High, $25,000 a year. The best in the country, right? We have some families paying almost a quarter of a million dollars for high school education. Do they take the MCAS? No. So there's no correlation between the score and the uh, salary that you'll make at the end of the year. So that's a complete fallacy. And then the last one that I want to address before I turn it over to Jack. So there was a story in the news yesterday about how, oh, there was a poll and 87% want us to test in social studies and history because we don't teach it anymore. That's right. Uh, we have not been teaching history for a long time in elementary school because it's not in the test. But trust me, if you start to te test it, doesn't mean we're going to teach it because we don't teach science, and we don't teach ELA, and we don't teach math at the elementary level. What we teach is test-taking skills. It's the reason, there's no critical thinking. And the last thing that I have to do, because I'm in this place in time, I really want you to think about the state of education. Three years ago, in the middle of a pandemic, the administrators in my district said we shouldn't be given the test. The superintendent said we shouldn't be given the test. School committee members said we shouldn't be given the test. But you know what? We gave it. Because we are complicit in a system and we're afraid of speaking out and standing up and fighting for the students who are not always winners. And Max, when I was coming into the building, somebody let me know that one of the reasons it's hard to get a parking spot here today is because there's a ceremony for the Gold Star Mothers uh, downstairs. Well, my aunt co-founded the POW MIA movement. And as a young girl, I watched her stand up and speak out, even when she was afraid. And it's not lost on me that I had to leave a classroom, a school with three of my grandchildren I'm in the building, because I have to stand up, speak out, and fight for the schools that all of us deserve, with counselors, with a living wage for everybody. And so I ask that you join us in this fight to end the punitive nature of this testing regime.
Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see all these friendly faces. I know lots of you here. Good to see Rep Hawkins and Senator Jalen, because one of the titles I have, I'm Jack Schneider, uh, is co-founder of the Massachusetts Consortium for Innovative Education Assessment. They've been two champions of our consortium, as well as of the Education Commonwealth Project, which I'm the executive director of, which is seeking to provide free and open source tools for all public schools and districts here in the Commonwealth to rethink how we measure student learning and school quality. I'm also an associate professor at UMass Lowell. I'm an MTA member. I'm honored to have been asked here by the MTA to speak just a little bit about measurement accountability, which is one of the areas that I do research in. So let's just start with why we have a measurement and accountability system, right? We have a measurement and accountability system so we can know how our schools are doing and so that we can strengthen our schools, right? Measurement and accountability. Well, let's think about the extent to which the existing system does either of those two things. Right? Regardless of how you feel about standardized tests, they are the heart of our measurement accountability system. If they're accomplishing their aims, then maybe they should remain. And if they're not, maybe we should rethink the way that we've been doing this. So let's think about measurement. Right? If you want to know how schools are doing, one way you can try to find out is by looking at the data. Right? Well, how does DESE measure school quality. I won't bore you with all the details, but it's a test score, 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 attendance, which correlates, by the way, and I can send you the research on it, with test scores, graduation rates for high school, which also correlates with test scores, progress towards English language proficiency, right? We've basically run through the measures here. And I can tell you that these things do not align with what most families, educators, young people themselves, community members, and other stakeholders think about when they think about what schools do and what schools are for. Right? So one of the key aspects of my research over the past 10 years, and we've driven this forward through both MCIEA and the Education Commonwealth Project, is to actually ask people, what should schools do? Right? What's a good school? What are the components of school quality? And I bet if we had more time, you right now could write down a bunch of the things that you think schools should do or currently do. We don't have that time, so I'll just tell you some of the things that good schools do and that we build into our approach. Right? Good schools do things like make young people feel safe, encourage young people to value learning, provide the kinds of social, emotional, and psychological supports that are necessary for them to succeed. Good schools engage young people. I was just on a call earlier today with leadership in the Lowell Public Schools where they were talking about how badly they want to get young people engaged and how they are actually swimming upstream against the current measurement accountability system because that's not something they're encouraged to do. Good schools bring different young people together from across different walks of life. Right? That was one of the key priorities for my wife and myself when we were choosing a school for our daughter, that she go to a racially and economically diverse school. Right? Where is that in our measure of school quality? Right? Good schools expose people to the creative and performing arts. Right? They're places of play and discovery. Critical thinking was mentioned just a minute ago. So our current system doesn't measure any of that. Right? And if, and I can share the research with you, if the things that we measured actually correlated with all the other elements of school quality, right? So I think the right metaphor here is if a single tile in the mosaic gave you the entire picture, then we could get away with it. We could say, oh, well, we'll just measure these few things. We'll measure MCAS scores in math and ELA, science at a couple grade levels. We'll do some growth scores, attendance, graduation rates, and that'll actually give you the whole picture, even though we don't measure most of the stuff that people care about. But that isn't the case. Right? There's no correlation in most cases. So I was going to share a slide, and we decided it was a little too wonky, where, where I have color-coded all of the components of school quality and shown the degree to which they correlate with each other. A very strong correlation would be green. A very strong inverse correlation would be red. And what we see instead is a sea of yellow and orange. What does that mean? That each component of school quality is relatively independent of the other qualities, right? So a school could be, imagine this, really good at raising MCAS scores and really bad at engaging students, right? A school could be really good 
at getting students to show up and really bad at making them feel safe and valued. And so if we actually want to measure school quality and know how our schools are doing, then we ought to measure school quality and not pretend that that's what we're actually doing. If we want to measure student learning, then we ought to measure student learning. Unfortunately, our present indicators tell us more about student background variables than about what they're learning in school, right? So even this measure that seems like it measures the thing we're trying to measure doesn't actually do that, right? So what are we doing here in our measurement and accountability system? Let's talk about the accountability part, right? So that's the measurement part, not working. Let's think about the accountability part. Well, maybe accidentally it improved all of our schools despite being an invalid, undemocratic, inequitable approach. Maybe, by accident. Well, we can look at the data. It was alluded to earlier that our achievement gaps are wider than ever, right? I was on the radio relatively recently with uh, somebody from the Pioneer Institute who was insisting that MCAS has made us number one in the nation. And I said number one at having an achievement gap, right? That's what you mean. And he said, no, 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 number one at well, we happen to be a pretty wealthy state, which is why we can afford to do things like actually ensure that all of our schools are equitably funded. That's why our MCAS scores are so high on average, right? But if you dig into the data and you look at, well, how are our economically marginalized students doing? How are our ethnically, racially, and linguistically minoritized students doing? Well, gosh, doesn't seem like MCAS was the cure-all for them, was it? So, Let's think then about accountability and how it works. If what we're doing is measuring a very narrow range of school quality, and it turns out not even measuring that thing, student learning, we're actually measuring demography, then what we're doing is we're incentivizing schools to try to game this system. Yep. We're incentivizing schools to try to do things like teach to the test, right? Narrow the curriculum, the sorts of things that actually pain me personally as the father of, I'm going to start crying here, as the father of a seventh grader in the public schools who used to love learning, right? Mm -hmm. Dan. <laughs> Mr. The, Dean is real. The thing that's worse, oh. there's a worse thing. The thing that's worse is that it exacerbates segregation. After you leave, go on to Trulia or Zillow or Redfin and see how they use ratings of schools to steer people towards particular neighborhoods. I did it several years ago. Google Jack Schneider, Washington Post, greatschools.org. You'll get the link or email me directly and I'll send it to you. Right? Had a long conversation with the leadership at great schools afterwards, right? which wanted a retraction. I threatened to file a lawsuit. And if anybody wants, I keep floating this idea of a lawsuit against them because I, I, I think they're in violation of the Fair Housing Act. Right? But what you'll find is that you can slide a bar, 0 to 10. Well, who wants a 0 school for their kids? Not me. I slid it to 10. Well, all the schools in the neighborhood disappeared. Right? I can't live there anymore. So I thought, well, 10, that's pretty high standards. Where am I going to find a 10? Well, all I had to do was zoom out, right? Lots of towns that start with W had 10s, right? <laughs> right? Oh, all I got to do is move to Wellesley, right? That's where the schools are good, or Weston, or Whalen, right? That's where the schools are good. Well, are they? Is it that that's where the schools are good, right? Or is it that's where our most privileged students go to school? And our narrow, ill-conceived, illegitimate, unjust system of measuring schools actually is driving people to schools that serve, serve privileged communities. And that the very people they're driving are people who already have the privilege to join those communities. You can see how this cycle will reproduce itself and you can see how already marginalized communities will become even more marginal and stigmatized. This is not a system that works. You want to talk about things like, well, what about MCAS in a zero-stakes setting? Fine, we can talk about that. Let's talk about that. 
But let's not pretend that the measurement accountability system that we currently have either measures or holds accountable in a way that accomplishes the things we're trying to accomplish for all young people in the Commonwealth. Happy to talk about any of that with y'all later. Uh, I can't be Googled because I write pretty frequently for the public and sometimes end up on Fox News. So Jack underscore Schneider at UML.edu. We'll talk about all the things you want to talk about. Thank you so much. If, if the high stakes testing regime can last one more year after those presentations, then I don't know how that's possible. This has to be the time we get rid of this destructive system. We've been talking about it for too long, and it has to, it has to end for all the reasons that were just, were just laid out. Um, we have two more presentations I want to turn to. We have educators who've spent their lives um, serving the public, serving our, our students, and they go into retirement and want a simply a dignified retirement. And Phyllis Newfeld's going to explain how that's not happening and we need to fix it. Good afternoon. My name is Phyllis Newfeld. I'm a retired teacher. I taught for 40 years. And I'm a member of MTA's Retired Members Committee. I'm here today to bring awareness to the retiree pension cost of living adjustment better known as COLA, which is supposed to offset the impact of inflation on our pensions. And I emphasize the words supposed to offset. For retired Massachusetts state employees and teachers, the COLA benefit has historically been capped, no matter how much inflation grows. The annual increase over the past decade has been 3% of only the first $13,000 of a retiree's pension earnings, or just $390 a year. This is grossly unfair knowing how much inflation has risen. The average teacher pension in Massachusetts is $46,702. So a 13,000 COLA base means that the annual percentage of COLA has been an increase of less than 1% for most retirees. For FY23, the legislature raised the COLA to 5%, but even this is less than a 1.5% increase for the average retiree, and it was only for one year. By comparison, members of the Social Security system receive a COLA based on their full amount of their benefit. In 2023, that's going to be 8.7%. It's important to remember that Massachusetts public employees, including educators, don't participate in the social security system. That means for many of us, it is our state pension that we live on. For those who may have social security benefits, either from the private sector or due to a spouse, the federal GPO and WEP provisions mean that the little we do get is dramatically reduced. And I can tell you from experience, because I earned my quarters, I get only a very small portion of what I earned. I once heard that the pension is fine if you die soon enough. The pension starts off fine, but it can't keep up with the rate of inflation. So the standard of living declines if we manage to stay alive. I can't believe that's what the state of Massachusetts intended as the outcome. High inflation, along with rising health costs and other living expenses, continue to erode the value of our pensions, and as a direct result, our quality of life. Food costs have risen dramatically since the pandemic, as almost everything else has. I'm paying more for a washing machine than months ago. It was $500 cheaper. Heating and electrical bills are through the roof. My electrical bill is at least 40% higher now than it was just a few years ago. This erosion will continue until the state steps in to provide a more realistic COLA over the long term by increasing the base on which it's calculated. 
Otherwise, there is no possible way for retirees to keep their standard of living with inflation rising as rapidly as it is. Retired educators deserve a cost of living increase each year that adequately protects our pensions from the ravages of inflation and allows us to retire with dignity and economic security after years of serving our students. We deserve a COLA that allows us the standard of living necessary for a full life, not one that is only adequate if we die soon enough. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Phyllis. We have, we have to achieve the dignity and justice for our ESP members, and we also have to, on the other end, when people retire, retain, um, achieve dignity for our retired, <coughs> retired educators. This also seems self-evident, and now we, have, we certainly have the money to do it. I want to step back for one second and just tell people that what M MTA is developing with its allies in unions, also um, Citizens for Public Schools, is a bill that will completely undermine, in a good way, uh, the high stakes testing regime, getting rid of the graduation requirement. I I'll invite you later to come look at the, the, uh, the graph over there that shows there's no correlation between having a graduation requirement, a standardized test graduation requirement, and uh, test scores in anywhere in the nation. That's just one reason to get rid of that, but also to shrink its influence on identifying quote unquote underperforming districts as re required by federal law and eliminating receivership. We've done an experiment for the past 12 years, Holyoke, Lawrence, Southbridge, and it's been an abject failure. Took away the democratic governing of those city school districts. It's been a failure. Let's get rid of it. Let's stop, let's stop, stop the, the insanity. Last but not least at all, is I wanna invite Deb Jeswaldo, the president of the Malden Educators Association, to talk about our call for simply retrieving uh, human right, which is the right to strike for public employees. Thank you and good afternoon. My name is Deb Giswaldo. I'm a proud public school music educator and the president of the Malden Education Association. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that before I came here this afternoon, I was at Logan Airport with striking Swissport USA workers who are fighting for their union with SEIU 32BJ and fighting against rampant wage theft. And those of you who are in the room have the ability to help them win their union. And I hope that you will use the privilege and the power that you have to help them not only just win their union, but to stop the rampant wage theft that is going on that they are fighting against every week when they are waiting for their paychecks. Um, going on strike, is not an easy decision for anyone, especially given the fact that it is illegal in Massachusetts for public sector workers to go on strike. It makes it an even more weighty decision. You might be wondering, how did we get to the point of considering, even considering going on strike in Malden back in October? Well, we went to the bargaining table in May with all of our proposals written, really well thought out, we'd had conversations upon conversations upon conversations with our members. We had actually been trying to get dates for bargaining for a couple of months, and we were met with extreme stalling tactics to even get dates for bargaining, and we finally got there in May. We went to the table, we gave over pages and pages and pages of proposals, and we were met with not even questions in response. For three months, we didn't even get any proposals in return. For about five months, we basically had almost all of our proposals unanswered, unresponded to. Um, for the first five months of bargaining, we only received five proposals from the school committee. And session after session after session, we sat across the table from a school committee that just looked at us. And I'm not making this up or exaggerating it because for nearly every bargaining session, we had about 100 silent representatives observing us, not just from the Malden Education Association, but from other MTA locals, from Cambridge, from Brookline, from Wellesley, from as far away as Charlton came to observe the bargaining process because we opened it up 
to be really transparent and public. And when I say we, it was the union members that opened it up because the school committee didn't want people to see their extreme stalling tactics and the disrespect, the disregarding of our educators and the demeaning that happened throughout the process. After six months of unanswered proposals and only a smattering of proposals from, from the school committee that didn't even reflect the goals of equity and inclusion that the district purports to have, the educators of the MEA couldn't withstand any more of the disrespect or any more of their extreme stalling. So the inaction of the school committee was hurting everyone, educators, students, families, the community. It was hurting all of us. And so the only thing that we could do, because we had tried everything, the only thing that was left for us to do was to go on strike. And so we decided that's what we would do. And going on strike was an act of love for our students, for our community, for each other, and for other locals across the Commonwealth. And I look out at my friend Tim Briggs, and I'm gonna cry as I talk about this. I look out at Tim Briggs from Haverhill because it was an act of love in Haverhill too, where students and educators weren't safe in their school buildings. We weren't safe in our school buildings in Malden, and we still have miles to go before we sleep, and we had no choice in Malden. They had no choice in Haverhill. And we had to take an illegal action because that illegal action is what was right. And it shouldn't be illegal. We shouldn't be putting our careers on the line to make it right because the school committees refuse to do what's right. Students supported our strike. The community overwhelmingly supported our strike. And union educators in our locals and across the Commonwealth and across the country, all the way across the Atlantic and Europe, all the way into Central and South America, supported our strike because it is what was right. We went on strike not just for ourselves, but for the schools our students deserve and for the common good because we were fighting for housing justice and housing security for our students and the school committee would not engage in conversation about keeping our students and their families in their homes and that was vile. The right to strike is a human right and the continued prohibition on the right to strike is a continued prohibition on every single blessed public sector worker's right to free speech. We shouldn't have less rights than any other worker in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And continuing to deny our right to strike is also saying no to the community and to our students who stand with us when we're bargaining our contracts that create better learning environments for them and contracts that contain common good language that lift up our entire community. Lifting the prohibition on the right to strike will actually guarantee that contract bargaining is taken more seriously by elected officials. Nobody wants to go on strike. We want to be with our students, but we also want to be in great working conditions. We want our students in great learning conditions. We want contracts that give us dignity and respect in the workplace. And we want contracts that lift up all workers in all communities. But when we're disrespected, dismissed, and demeaned during the bargaining process and left to sit for months across a bargaining table from school committees that just look at us, don't engage in discussion and literally, and I mean this, literally, just leave our proposal sitting on the table at the end of bargaining sessions, we're left with no recourse under the current law but to put ourselves at risk. We're left with no way to ensure that we can take action on behalf of ourselves as workers, our students, and our communities. Like Vermont and Pennsylvania, we should have the right to strike because it's the right and just thing to do. Once the strike vote was taken in Malden, the school committee finally, finally after six months, engaged in real discussions with us and responded to proposals that had been sitting unanswered for those six months. Had they taken our strike vote more seriously, they wouldn't have waited until Sunday. We took the vote on a Friday. They wouldn't have waited until Sunday to meet with us. They would have met with us on Saturday. 
as well as Sunday, and we would never have had to actually go on strike. The school committee, after 12 hours, almost 12 hours of bargaining on a Sunday, where Max Page sat with us, Deb McCarthy sat with us, other presidents of other locals sat with us. The president of the National Education Association sat with us and saw what happened. We bargained for 12 hours, and the school committee caucused after 11, 12 hours and decided they didn't want to talk anymore because they didn't want to talk about a living wage for education support professionals who are making $22,000 a year. So they decided they didn't want to talk anymore and they declared impasse and they walked out of the room even after we implored them to continue talking to us. But you know why they walked out of that room? They told people we couldn't do anything about it because public sector strikes are illegal and because they're illegal, we would all be in the schools the next day at work, business as usual, because we couldn't actually call the strike and go on strike. Well, you know what we did? We called the strike. We went on strike. And the next day, they met with us for another four or five hours and we came to an agreement. It took us about, uh, between Sunday and Monday, about 16, 17 hours. And in those 16, 17 hours, we got a contract that we couldn't do in six months because the school committee refused to do it. Workers shouldn't have to take this unending disrespect in the workplace and expired contracts for months or even years sometimes just because the school committee doesn't want to engage and doesn't want to talk about wages, especially living wages for people who are making poverty wages, people who are serving our most needy, medically fragile students just because they don't want to engage in the collective bargaining process and they don't want to respect workers, students, or the communities. 17 hours it took, 16, 17 hours of active bargaining to come to an agreement for three bargaining units. We were on strike for one day. One day. One day in Malden, one day in Brookline, one day in Dedham, four days in Haverhill, after, in some places, months and years of sitting across the table with no movement. It's amazing how quickly things get done when a school committee has to take it seriously. Having the right to strike will not impede bargaining. It will actually help it, and bargaining will progress faster if we have the right to strike because school committees will have to take bargaining seriously. And I actually think we will see fewer public sector strikes because school committees will have to take the bargaining process more seriously. We are your constituents. Parents and caregivers of our students are your constituents. Our students are your constituents. It is time to hear our voices and allow us our full rights by giving us the right to strike. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. And I do just want to make sure everyone knows that, that the president of the Brookline Education, Educators Association, Union, sorry, Jessica winter is here, and Tim Briggs from Haverhill. And I just want to underscore that last point, which was beautifully said. It's a public service. It ends a long-standing dispute that has gone on often. I think it was two or three years in Brookline and ends it quickly. And it produces better schools. All the contracts achieved by Haverhill, by Malden, by, by Dedham, by Brookline achieved closer to living wages for ESPs, include more safety for educators, and started to, on the path towards fighting for housing justice for for, um, for Malden families. So this is something that needs to happen. It's, it's 100 years old. It comes from, frankly, a, um, an, a, an attack on the Boston um, police force back in 1919. Um, but it is time now to achieve this because it's, for those in the building who are friends of labor, proclaim themselves to be friends of labor, it's time now to achieve uh, the right to strike, return what is a human right back to the public sector workers. So we've come to an end. I just want to say thank you all for being here. Um, and let us now pass all these five bills. We're glad to talk after with you about each of them and uh, provide whatever information we can. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you.